Good morning. It's Allie with the Boreal Bloom Homestead. Um, Kevin and I are outside today. It is a beautiful day here in Alberta. We are so fortunate to be having this kind of weather. Probably the perfect day for chicken chores. But we're out. <laughs> Thank you, dueling roosters. We are out here this morning um, doing our morning routine. So we usually come out about 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning during the winter because it's dark here until 8.30 um, for some of the winter. Um, this allows our birds to kind of have a chance to lay their eggs and go outside and scratch around, have a snack. And it allows us to come in and collect eggs without kind of disturbing them. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna collect our eggs and then we're gonna give them what we like to call a treat tray. So these birds are very spoiled. Every morning we come out and we give them fresh fruit and vegetables. Um, you know, it could include leftovers from last night's salad. Uh, there is some scrambled eggs in here because they are laying up a storm. We've got a couple eggshells. There is some hot pepper flakes. We have uh, some gourds left over from the garden last year that we've been hanging on to, and we like to chop one of those fresh guys up for them in the morning. And so they absolutely love their treat trays. So we, we enjoy going out and uh, giving the girls a little treat for all their hard work. I hear somebody squawking, so let's go inside and check out what we got for eggs today. Hey gang, hold on. It's looking like the one and only sketchy Becky is about to lay an egg. Holy cow, I missed it on camera, but she literally just laid that egg right there. <laughs> okay, girls, let's see what's under here. Oh. We're not hiding anything today. What about this guy? What do you got under there, big girl? Oh, look at that. Another green one. I'm sorry to take that egg you just laid, but I'm gonna. Watch out. There we go. Five beautiful eggs already this morning. Hey, girls. chicken coop this morning and Kevin and I thought it would be really valuable to show you as part of our chicken coop tour what we do in the coop to maintain um, I guess cleanliness and sanitation in the coop throughout the winter and kind of explain and show you how the glitter uh, bedding method is working for us what do you think yeah for sure and it's working really good so far so you know, we've been able to maintain it from when we cleaned it in the fall and every week or so we just add in new bedding. Today we're going to do a little bit extra. We got some peat moss to throw in as well as some hemp bedding to add some um, a little bit more browns. carbon browns to, to the mix here. Right. So deep litter bedding is basically composting. So if you're already composting, do you have a really great idea on how to do deep litter? bedding. If you don't compost, basically composting is three ingredients. There is carbon, which is dried plant material, like wood shavings or straw 
or <laughs> hemp hemp mulch. It is green materials, which is nitrogen. So fresh plant greens, chicken poop, those kind of things are your greens. And the last ingredient to compost is moisture. So we are getting a lot of moisture <laughs> through their feces and their droppings. So, as well as them breeding. There's 22, right. there's 24 of them counting our two roosters in our coop. So that creates a lot of moisture as well. Right. So in order to maintain a healthy compost, you need to watch the balance of all of these ingredients. So for us, we watch the balance because we have a lot of snow. So our chickens not only leave us moisture in their droppings and through respiration, they also track in some moisture on their feet. So it's important for us to keep a close eye on it. But basically, deep litter is working awesome. We are standing in here and it smells fine. Like it doesn't Yeah, stink. like it's not, it's not minty fresh, but it's I, not no, like... No, it's not it's, like a three-way <laughs> candle or yeah, something fancy. Yeah, but for sure it's, it's but, you can walk in and you don't smell the ammonia, which all. is when you do smell ammonia as a human, it is already past the limit where you need to start adding more carbon in to take care of that smell for your chickens because it's not healthy for them. Absolutely. So like Kevin said, we've done a little bit of research on this and, um, we as humans can start to smell ammonia around 15 parts per million. Your birds start to have adverse effects at 25 parts per million. So honestly, if you're doing the deep litter method, as soon as you walk in the coop and you smell a hint of ammonia, it's time to start taking care of the problem. And the best way to do that is actually through maintenance throughout the whole life of your deep litter. Exactly. So this morning, we're going to get ready. We're going to clean up the roosting bars and whatnot. And the, the poop shield. And the poop shield over the nesting boxes. We'll get that all on the floor. We'll add in some peat moss. We'll add in some hemp bedding. We're going to refresh the nesting boxes. And with whatever's left, we'll throw the rest of the shavings from that bag in here. We'll give it a good churn with our um, garden hoe is what we use. But for the most part, our chickens uh, root and kick up the bedding material on their own. Absolutely. Like our chickens are very active in here. They love to dig through the bedding. I have no idea what they're finding, but uh, little Miss, is that Becky? Little Miss Becky down here is digging a hole to China right at Kevin's feet. So they are excellent at helping us. I'm sorry. It's egg laying time of day. And they like, there's some stuff going on in the box here. Um, but our birds are absolutely great little stakeholders and helping us to maintain their cleanliness in their coop. So we're very fortunate that everything's working, but like Kevin said, we're going to refresh and then we're going to move on with our chicken chores and we'll give you um, the rest of the coop tour. tour from what we did, how it's going so far, what things we might change. And majority of it is stuff that we did on the outside. And we'll talk to that a little bit later in the video. And one last thing we forgot to mention before we get to starting to do things is the heat lamps provide the necessary heat required for the composting process. Oh, we didn't talk about right. that. Right, sorry, I did need to mention that. So we have been deep littering since what, October? Yeah. And we have noticed the majority of the breakdown and the more rapid decomposition is happening since we turned on our heat lamps. So we'll talk about that a little bit later more, but we did have to turn on our heat lamps and it's actually doing really good for the bedding too. Not just the birds. Yeah, 100%. <gasps> Ooh. <laughs> Sid didn't like that. Okay, so one thing that I forgot to point out is if you are doing the deep litter method, it is absolutely crucial to have sufficient ventilation in your coop. So ventilation allows ammonia gas from their droppings to escape. It also allows moisture to escape and the ammonia and the moisture kind of bind together and leave at the same time. So it is vitally important to ensure that you have proper ventilation in your coop to accommodate the need for excess ventilation. In our coop have, uh, oh, Kevin's cuddling with Jules, how cute. Um, we in our coop have a bathroom exchange fan um, right in the center of the roof and it is wired to a timer and that timer runs for 15 minutes and it's off for, sorry, that fan runs 15 minutes on and 15 minutes off, 24 hours a day, regardless of the temperature outside and regardless of the temperature inside. So it's very important to have adequate ventilation. If you don't have adequate ventilation, your ammonia is gonna build up and it's just gonna be really bad for yourself and your birds. And your birds.
right, well, we're gonna get started here, but one thing to remember, safety first. When we're gonna be churning everything up, it's gonna create a lot of dust with some unhealthy things that we don't wanna inhale in. So let's make sure, masks on, keep yourself safe. As you can see, I like to fill my nest boxes super full. The reason for this is we now have 22 girls that lay in. And you know what? They really pack out those chips really quick. So while it looks super full today, I bet you in a couple of days, it'll be quite packed down and it won't look quite over full. But they sure do seem to love it when I fill them right up to the top. So we're outside hanging in the chicken run. We're gonna go over the lean-to that I built last fall. Uh, overall, it worked very well. Uh, it allows the chickens in the bath, in the back to do their dust bath, which uh, they're using this morning. Uh, it gives a covered portion for their food to stay uh, with the lid access, which is working really well. Other than we got to figure out a more permanent way to prop the door up, which I'll probably tackle that later this winter or early in the spring. Uh, the water is two heated dog dishes that I put inside the frame that I made, it just allows it from them potentially uh, knocking or spilling the water while they're using it. Um, the one thing that we did switch was we went back to our summer layer feed, which was a little bit more expensive, but it was in a bigger mash, so bigger chunks. Uh, we found with the other one that we switched to, it was, it was a lot finer. And with that, the chickens would kind of throw it all over the place, which brought in some mice, which you know, even if we had that or not, I'm just thinking, you know, we live out in the country, we're going to get mice no matter what. But to uh, fix that problem, we just got a live trap that we've set out in underneath their lean-to. And overall, it works great having it tarped off. I would highly recommend it gives them a nice little area that keeps them out of the elements, keeps their water, um, the snow away from their water, food and dust bath, which is keeping it easy to maintain. So overall, I would call the chicken lean to a win. Using straw in the run was also a huge success for us. As you can see, these guys are outside. They spend more of their time outside than they do inside. Honestly, almost in any weather, cold, warm, beautiful like today, they are outside, they're rooting around, they're digging through the straw. They absolutely love having the straw. So the straw did exactly what I thought. It insulated from the snow and it allows them to come outside and enjoy being outside because they don't like to trek on the snow. So we had to make a concession and you know what? It has worked great. So one thing about straw is, well, a few things about straw, I guess. It's cheap, so it was easy for us to find. It was inexpensive to purchase and it lasts a long time. Um, the straw also is great at creating bedding for them because as it snows, when they root through it and walk on it, the snow falls through. So we haven't had to refresh this bedding as many times as you would think, considering the amount of snow that we've gotten this year. So small snow falls a couple centimeters or an inch or so, not a problem. If we get larger dumps like we got last week and the week before and the, and the week before, you have to either rake up the snow and we've just been through, oh, somebody just shook out after a dust bath. You either have to rake out the the straw underneath 
the tarp or just kind of rake it and chuck it once it's covered in snow and lay down some fresh straw for them. Um, but it, all in all, absolutely 100% win on the straw. Having it behind the coop there, tarped up, was perfect. It's easy to get to, so it's easy to use. It is dry. It's not frozen in clumps. It is perfect. Um, the other thing that we did, um, Kevin wanted to tarp off a little area right outside the run, and it was such a great idea. I kind of balked at it a bit, but I love it. This area is probably one of their favorite spots. They get the sunlight coming in from the side because of the translucent tarps, and they get a warm space to hang out. So they do spend a lot of time under here, especially when it's super cold. So either way, we're calling it a major success because we're happy that our birds are going outside more. They are outside all the time. And although today is a really nice day, like it's, I think it's minus two. So it's like barely below freezing. Um, they come out at minus 20. They come out at minus 30. They come out and they're happy to be outside. With success also comes ways to tweak it to make things more successful. So some things that we would change are number one, we are going to make a more permanent structure to hold this tarp. What we found was with the high amount of snow that we had this year, um, it kind of encroached on their tarp area quicker than we anticipated. So it's it kind of closed up their space. Um, so what we were talking about is building some sort of a frame structure. I was thinking like um, gymnastics, like balance beam kind of a thing. And we'll place it near nearer to the door so that the tarp can kind of slope from the roof downwards um, and then that will just give them more space and probably be easier for us to clean overall. Um, another thing that I want to point out that um, is our own choice and we wouldn't change it is that by keeping all of these trees in here it made building the run more work it also makes winter maintenance a little bit more work. That said, I do not want to get rid of any trees. We want to keep them for as long as we possibly can in this run to create that environment that we want for our birds. But it does present problems, uh, especially when shoveling out snow to create space for them to move. It is a little bit more difficult. So that is one thing to consider. And that is one thing that I did not consider when we were building it. Um, so I guess let that be a lesson to you. Um, one other thing that I do have to mention in relation to the snow is we covered this run. So I will link to a video where we discuss covering the run. And I have to tell you, it was the, one of the most grueling parts of the process. You can ask Kevin, but it was a hundred percent worth it. I was working last fall and I could hear my birds. They, they were not happy. So I came sprinting out here and there was a huge hawk sitting right on top of the mesh along the roof. So 100% it was worth having the um, the two by two mesh on the roof of the run. Now it is it does add a little bit more work. Like I said, we've had some larger dumps of snow. And one thing that we have to remember is to come out and knock the snow off of the wire. So generally a small snowstorm, it falls through, but if it's thick, heavy snow, it absolutely sags the wire mesh. So we need to come out and we just bump it with the back of a broom and it all falls through and it's no problem. But it is something to consider if you're covering your run. The last thing we'll talk about before we get going, refreshing the outside of the coop is talking about the tarps on the outside of our run. So uh, we live in Northern Alberta. We get really cold weather. We've just been very fortunate the last couple of weeks, but next week it's gonna drop down to minus 20 Celsius. The wind's gonna pick up. So having these tarps around their whole uh, run uh, allows them to keep that chill away from them. So they do come outside even in the colder days of the winter. Uh, a couple things that I would improve upon is how I have the tarp here for the door. So I kind of attached it up here. So when we need to remove snow, it can get a little bit in the way. We'll make it work this year, but next year I'll definitely cut in an actual door with easy access for snow removal. And another good thing to point out is when you come into our run, you actually step down about uh, six to eight inches which uh, it wasn't done on purpose. Uh, we just kind of lucked out, but for winter snow removal, it works out that, you know, we can have six inches of snow and we can still come in here and uh, 
get access to without having to do snow removal every time it snows. So, you know, these are a few things that worked out good, a few things that we would change, but definitely recommend tarping the outside of your runs if you can. We are back for part two of our winter chicken coop tour. Now, we never intended on this to be a two-part uh, video series. We were hoping it would be a quick uh, tour of our coop and all the things that we're doing to kind of keep it up throughout the winter. But our awesome neighbors called out with an SOS yesterday with the super warm weather and the large amount of snow that we got, everything kind of turned into ice yesterday. And he was, uh, he's got cows and horses that he's got at another location that he's bringing out to his property over here. So he was down kind of a small little embankment with his trailer and he got stuck. So what we had to do is I came over with my skid steer and between him, between myself, him, and his skid steer, we were able to get him out, but that took away the rest of our day. And so hence, here we are again, part two, to finish things up. You bet. So there are a few things that we wanted to cover that we didn't get to cover yesterday. So one of them I really wanted to talk about was the heat lamps. That there's a lot of noise about heating the coop on the internet. Anybody that you ask has a very strong opinion about it. We, read extensively about the ways to make sure that you don't need to heat the coop to keep your chickens happy. There is a lot of stuff out there about it, but what isn't out there about it is, sorry, <laughs> the stitch just came through my legs here. Um, what isn't out there about it is discussions on how does that information apply to what is going on in your situation. So your flock is maybe a different size than that person's, your coop may be insulated differently, your climate may be different. So one of... There's a lot of factors that go into There's a lot of factors yeah. that go into making that decision. And, and for me, you know, we tried, we did what we thought was right in the beginning, we did not heat, um, and we found our birds, especially her here, this big feller, um, he struggled with frostbite despite our best intentions, despite having the proper ventilation, despite all those things, he got a pretty bad frostbite on his yeah, comb. And the reason being, like I said, he has a large kind of floppy, floppy comb. comb. So, right. you know, one thing that we would say to people, you know, raising chickens, where in zone three, zone or, three whatever. or colder is, you know, I would focus on getting a breed if you're going to keep a rooster to have a small comb. So uh, this spring we're going to uh, invest, you know, to get a few more chickens into our flock. And we're most likely going to go with an Americana because they have the small little pea style comb. So that would be perfect for us. So that's one big thing to consider right, in regards in to your climate. choosing Absolutely. your breeds. So we actually have a video about winterizing our chicken coop and we spoke at length about avoiding using heat lamps. We know that they're a fire hazard. We know that they cost a lot of money with high electricity bills as they are. Anyways, um, we really tried our best to avoid it. And to be fair, we could have avoided it. Our, our chickens would have survived in this coop with the things that we've done and they would have been fine through the winter. Yeah, the only thing is, is they're literally putting all their energy into staying warm. And that's literally, like I said, they, how they spend most of their day is they, they would have survived, but all their efforts from the feed and what went into staying warm. Right. So we went from getting, you know, a handful of eggs a day over the fall to getting zero eggs. And what... <laughs> Apparently it's always egg laying time here, but okay. So we went from getting a handful of eggs every day to getting literally zero eggs a day. And once we added back the heat in the coop after our nasty cold snap, we started to get eggs and it's, it started quick and it went fast and furious. And we now are pulling out up to 16 eggs a day from 22 laying hens. So I'm feeling like that's a pretty good um, start here. So, I mean, yeah, we wanted to avoid it, but as with everything, you have to adjust on the fly. That is how you're successful. Um, the other thing is adding the heat lamp actually 
improve the decomposition in the deep litter bedding. So yeah. we kind of mentioned that earlier, but it did. Our stuff is now breaking down and like, it's not wet. It's not, it's not dry. It's not wet. It's, you know, it's turning it's into exactly what we were hoping it would turn into. Like when you squeeze it, it holds its shape briefly and falls apart. Um, the birds, since we added in the peat moss and the hemp and a little bit more shavings yesterday have done an excellent yeah, job. They, incorporating they've turned it all it. over and yeah, it's mixed very well now. So you bet. Uh, another thing that we wanted to talk about is, you know, I'm sure you've always uh, have either read or seen about, you know, hens having a little nest egg somewhere that people stumble upon. And we were pretty diligent about that. But, uh, you know, we got a coop that's got a barn style kind of top to it. And there was a little mezzanine up top that we checked every so often. And we never really saw some eggs until one day there was one kind of randomly sitting there. So I got up there, able to check with a ladder, and lo and behold, probably, I'm going to say about a week's worth yeah. of eggs we caught up there, probably, uh, I think there was 10. So we put some mesh above <laughs> to cover that off so the birds wouldn't get up there. So that's one of the things that we did to improve upon the setup inside. Oh, Herb, please no. Okay. And we'll just touch briefly on is our automatic door. Uh, so we put that in last fall, we're great. We decided to put it on the inside of the coop. Uh, but in doing so, you know, I had a function for, you could put it on a uh, light sensor. Uh, but with that being said, being inside the coop, uh, it didn't really function very well. So we just went over to the adjusting it to a certain time that it opened and closes, which you find works really well. And it allows us to kind of adjust it, you know, every, you know, two to three weeks, month, depending on the more daylight that comes or goes. So we make sure that the birds get their maximum amount of sunlight and fresh air in a day because they need that stuff to stay healthy. Absolutely. One thing too is we live quite far north. So our daylight hours are variable and they change rapidly from day to day, like the sunset changing by a few minutes each day absolutely impacts the hours of sunlight a day that we get over a shorter period of time. So in the winter, while we might get darkness between um, 3.30 in the afternoon to nine in the morning, in the summer, we almost have no darkness. So it is important and it is really nice that we're able to adjust this door to you know open and close as necessary it's very easy it's three buttons beep 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 and you can change it yeah and then one last thing is is we set our door right on the ground and what we've noticed now being roughly three months into the deep litter method is you know you keep adding chips so you know that chip builds up over the door so every day we have to make a point of making sure the Shavings are cleared out from the doorway. Uh, if not, that height slowly diminishes. Um, so that's one thing we could potentially change is adjust the height of the door to be like four inches off the ground. And one last thing that I want to talk about that I don't know, probably most of you already do, is nightly beak counts. So that is something that I've done since they were little. We, or I was little, I guess, since they were young chickens, we would come out and we would count everybody to make sure they were in the coop. Now, it seemed kind of silly. It was just something that we did. That being said, you know, we learned the importance of it really quickly when we had a big snowstorm a few weeks ago. So we had a hen fly up on top of the chicken lean to outside and some of the snow shed from the roof and covered her in a snow pile. She could not get out. That was heavy, wet snow. And she was probably under like four or five inches of snow. So when we came in that night, we counted everybody. There was one missing. We were like, okay, maybe we missed her. So we counted a few different times and we were still missing a bird. And we went and we checked the run and we could not find her. We looked for predators yeah. and we could yeah. not find any signs of feathers. We couldn't find any signs of tracks. We couldn't find anything. And so like I became frantic and I was like, I know this bird is in here. She can't get out and nothing got in. So I started like literally panic mode digging, digging through the snow and, and she found it. I found her on top of the, um, the lean to and she was covered in snow. I, 
I don't even know, like we were so lucky to have found her. We pulled her out and she was not really all that wet, but she did get some frostbite on her comb, obviously. But we pulled her out and we put her under the heat lamp and you know what, she's healthy as can be today. And she's actually laying us beautiful green eggs. But that is a lesson in, you know, Maintaining knowing your it, flock. Knowing, and, and how, knowing your flock. Knowing your flock. Absolutely. So, you know, had we not found her that night, I don't know if she would have gotten out. Probably not. You know, and then we would have had a very sad situation because we would have had a chicken that passed away simply because we didn't notice that she wasn't here. So that was a lesson to us to, you know, keep an eye on everybody and yeah. It's, it can be hard. Like, it can be hard to count 24 chickens that are roaming around. But, yeah. So, know. so overall, I, I think we covered everything that we plan to talk about today. Uh, we may have forgot about something, but I think we got, you know, the major ones. The that meat we, and potatoes, yeah. Yeah, meat and potatoes for sure. So, again, I hope you enjoyed, you know, what we're putting out there. Uh, if you do, subscribe to the channel and we should have some more content coming over the next month or so. Yeah, you bet. So I have things on the go here. I am going to start. I wish I would have started sooner, but circumstances being what they are, I am going to start some fodder for the birds. So I will chronicle that because they love fresh greens and it's easy for me to start fodder in the house so I can bring them a tray every day as long as the cycle continues and they can have some fresh greens, which we think is super important. Um, other than that, I mean, yeah, I hope that something that we did maybe struck a nerve for you or made something in your life easier or gave you a hint or a tip that you didn't know but yeah uh thanks for joining us on our you know our first winter with our birds and you know we're always open to suggestions and ideas if you think that there's something we should be doing or could be doing or that would make our life easier Man, let us know <laughs> like for sure we're all about that easy button but thanks again i'm Allie, and this is kevin and we'll see you soon yeah